honor to have the privilege of introducing our featured speaker today. Sandry, Sandy Rosenthal founded the major nonprofit levies.org with 25,000 supporters and chapters in five states while she and her family were evacuated from New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Her upcoming book, Words Whispered in Water, is about how she changed the national narrative about the flooding disaster in 2005 from Mother Nature to a federal civil engineering mistake in March of 2019. Rosenthal unveiled the first of its kind flooded house museum at the site of a major levee breach. Rosenthal hosts an annual guided levee breach bike tour. These are just a few of the sustainable ways that she separates fact from fiction. For those efforts, Rosenthal has been honored with numerous awards, including most recently, Outstanding Social Entrepreneur of the Year from Tulane University in 2018, and also Most Influential Woman from Mount Holyoke College. Rosenthal is an advocate for the 55% of the American population living in counties protected by levees. She is married to Stephen Rosenthal since 1979, has three adult children and one granddaughter. She also has two small dogs named Twinkie and Cupcake. It is truly an honor to have you Sandy, as our featured speaker and let's give us a warm virtual Golden Gate Breakfast Club welcome to our speaker, Sandy Rosenthal. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Craig. And good morning, Breakfast Clubbers. I've learned the terminology. And I'm about to give everyone a gift that they can use every time they watch a PowerPoint. So this is a little trick that you do on your end, okay? And it works if you're looking at a desktop or a laptop, okay? So, so here's the trick. Oh, first, I need to share my PowerPoint coming up. Okay, so there's my PowerPoint. All righty, now, so what, if, if, like I said, if you have a desktop or a, last, a laptop, take your cursor and bang it against the top of the screen and a green bar will appear, okay? On the right-hand side of that green bar, there is a black box at the right of the bar and it says view options, okay? Click on it. All right, and a menu will drop down. And at the very bottom option of that drop down menu says side by side mode. Click on it. Okay, and that's going to split your screen in two. And you should have my PowerPoint on the left side, and you should have a picture of me and only me on the right side. So what I'm doing here is since I can't be there with you, I'm trying to maximize this experience so that you're focused on me and my PowerPoint and nothing else as much as possible. So, so if you see me and only me on the right hand side of your screen, do nothing for a moment. If you see a whole bunch of other people on the right side of the screen, you need to bring your cursor up to the upper right and click on speaker view. Okay. So, so now I hope everyone is with me. And so right now there should be me and only me on the right and a po my PowerPoint on the left. One last little tiny thing. So on the box you see of me, okay, on the left-hand side of that box is two little white lines. Take your cursor, put it on those lines and drag drag the box, drag the lines to the left. I don't know which way is left for you. I don't know if this is newer. Drag them to the left and make me really big, okay? And make my PowerPoint a little smaller, okay? So these are tricks that only you can do on your end and you can use those tricks anytime you're viewing a PowerPoint. If you, want, if you don't wanna be a thumbnail like one of the clubbers was talking about earlier, 
Um, if you don't want to be a thumb, if you don't want to look at a thumbnail, that's how you do it. So, okay. If you didn't follow any of that, it's okay. It doesn't matter. I was just trying to maximize this viewing experience for watching this PowerPoint. So I'm going to go ahead and switch the PowerPoint to presentation mode and we shall begin. Okay. Words whispered in water, why the levees broke during Hurricane Katrina. After the levee breach disaster of 2005, during that 2005 storm, the Army Corps of Engineers, the builder of the levees, blamed anything except itself for those breaches. They refused to answer any questions until all the studies were complete. And you realize that took at least eight months for the studies to be complete. And that is only the preliminary ones. But you have to realize in the weeks after the disaster, the American people had watched all these, all these survivors on their rooftops and they wanted to know what happened now. That, you know, it's human. We don't want to wait eight months. So during that period of time where the Army Corps refused to answer any questions, the American people in Congress were given three reasons for the flooding. Monster storm, a city that was below sea level. And you know, they're all corrupt down there. So those were the three reasons that took flight. And a lot of people bought it. And I can understand why. I mean, after all, this is the Army Corps of Engineers with its 200 years of experience. They were the gold standard. This is the organization that had built tens of thousands of miles along the Mississippi, the Missouri, and the Ohio rivers that were capable of withstanding storm surges for, for um, 20 feet, okay, for 30 days or more every single year. The Army Corps, I mean, look, look, at, this, look at this photograph. This is incredible. So if the Army Corps of Engineers is that great an organization, the levee breaches cannot possibly be their fault. So I was in an unusual space after the levee breaches. My husband is an insurance man. He told me to pack for three weeks. He had, he had been through Betsy when he was a kid. And he said, Sandy, there won't be any internet, no electricity, no air conditioning. We won't be back for three weeks, pack for three weeks. And I did. And it put me in an unusual space, if you will, where I could watch the disaster and then I could watch the federal response. And I saw a lot of things that didn't make sense, but I did have time that most people didn't have to read and research. Oh, I should point out my home didn't flood. I was lucky. Uh, and my husband's business didn't flood and my son's school didn't flood. So I was in an unusually, unusually secure space to watch this disaster. And the big breakthrough for me was when four weeks after the flood, the Government Accountability Office released a report. And in that report, it stated, clear as glass, the Army Corps is responsible, you can read with me, for project design, and the local interests are responsible for maintenance. Well, if the Army Corps is responsible for design and construction, to be blaming local officials, which they did, was like blaming a janitor if the building, if a building fell to the ground. Keep in mind, the worst breaches were the newest ones. The 17th Street and the London, which don't mean anything to you, but these were the newest canals, both completed in 2000. These were the worst breaches. So I founded the grassroots group levies.org and I started asking questions and I received immediate pushback, a little tiny group, a fledgling group. And I got pushback from the Army Corps of Engineers, a federal agency that's under the Department of Defense and the American Society of Civil Engineers, which is this huge elite trade group. You know, that's a sign I'm onto something, right? Pushback, I must be on the right track. So, and this only reinforced my theory that the Army Corps was to blame. And when I saw these two organizations allying themselves, and meanwhile, there's a lawsuit forming. There, there was a lawsuit going on that had the Army Corps been found uh, financially liable, it could have meant billions and billions, okay? So, my organization, about <clears throat> uh, two years after the levee breach event, created a spoof of that cozy relationship between the Army Corps and the trade group. Well, the, the trade group did not enjoy that criticism. Um, and 
it, basically what this letter says is if you don't stop criticizing us, we will sue you. Okay. Fortunately in America, there are laws against suing little grassroots groups that are exercising a protected right to free speech, <coughs> speaking out for the public good. So uh, Adams and Reese, which is a local law firm, uh, combined with a very prominent San Francisco law firm called Cooley, that I hope you all have heard of, and stood by us and we dared the American Society of Civil Engineers to sue us and they withdrew their threat. Uh, and Levy.org announced this news in a very, very well attended press conference. So this gives you some idea of the harassment me and my organization got, and not just me, other people as well, which I discuss in my book. But anyway, for the next three years, my organization put historic plaques in the ground, vetted and fact checked by the uh, Office of Historic Preservation. We pushed for federal reform of the Army Corps of Engineers. And during this time, me using um, just back end tools available to any amateur blogger, discovered that the Army Corps was actually, their people were actually from their office were um, logging onto my blog and onto the news sources here and harassing me. Uh, we caught them using IP addresses. It was a very embarrassing moment for the Army Corps of Engineers. Anyway, but by 2011, this is now six years after the flood, I had a suggestion from a valuable advisor who suggested to me that levy.org nominate Le a levy breach site or several of them to the prestigious National Register of Historic Places. You realize it makes a lot of sense because the levy breach event changed America as we know it. 62% and not 55, which was in my introduction today, thank you, that wasn't your fault. But in just six weeks ago, I found out that 62%, almost two thirds of the American population lived by levies. And I found this information in a freedom of information request. And I'll get, I'll get to that later. But suddenly, you know, not suddenly, but over time, the big picture became more and more clear. Having to read uh, all these reports and prepare my nomination for the, for the National Register, uh, I found information that was buried deep in those reports that was absent from the executive summaries. Tricky little trick. So the information, oh, this information was so major and so important, even Levy experts Ivor Van Heerden and John Barry were surprised about it. I mean, who, who reads thousand page reports, okay? So the moral of the story is uh, the, not everything's in those executive summary. But anyway, the big picture became very clear that the Army Corps of Engineers is singularly at fault for the levee breaches, not the storm, not the geography of the city, and certainly not any imagined local corruption on the part of the people who live there. But in 2011, we had this fairy tale that was now household knowledge. And by 2011, I also had a lot of detractors, you know, paid trolls, bloggers, Pulitzer Prize winning journalists who had won prizes with the wrong information that was out in, in, uh, in early 2006 and seven. So, that, but then the, the good news is gradually my organization figured out that they all were repeating a conclusion by the University of California, Berkeley. The, the first report that came out in 2006. Now to be fair, that report was the first report. It was published without access to other ports by definition, right? It was published under an insane deadline on a shoestring budget. So what could go wrong? Well, this is what went wrong. They, they came up with an erroneous conclusion. Their conclusion was that the Army Corps had tried for years to obtain authorization to install floodgates that could be closed, that would have prevented flooding, and it would have been the superior solution. But local dysfunction prevented installation of the gates. That's the erroneous conclude, uh, that's the conclusion, and it's wrong. It's entirely wrong. It was a mistake, okay? So, a, a fairy tale, but now what? It, it's out there and everybody's quoting it. I mean everybody, all right? So, fortunately, the, the good doctors who wrote that conclusion saw the light. This is all documented in my book. Levy.org brought that wrong conclusion to their attention and they agreed that it was causing damage 
just by being out there, and they offered to write a new report, which they did. This new report would retract the wrong conclusion and replace it with the right one. It was published in 2015 in Water Policy, the official journal of the World Water Council, and an article about it was published in the New York Times. All media in this country knows what's published in the New York Times. And the, uh, the new conclusion, the right conclusion is, the Army Corps of Engineers made a tragic mistake when they misinterpreted the results of their E99 study, which was a large scale study that they did in the 1980s. They were looking for ways to save money on steel. They wrongly concluded that st st steel sheet pilings only needed to be driven down about 16 feet, not more than 16, one six, instead of 46, four six. The steel sheet pilings were too short. And when Hurricane Katrina's surge arrived, they fell over four feet below design specs. So after that article debut, all the major media stopped promoting that fairy tale. It was a big deal. So now I'm moving to, well, why should California care? Because two thirds of Americans live by levees, that's why. More people in the Sacramento area are in danger of levee failure and uh, poisoning, not poisoning, but salt infiltration into the drinking water. More people are in danger of that than Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi combined. So yeah, yes, California should care about its levees. And it does. After the levees broke in New Orleans, California did um, introduce a package of new laws pay, paying, you know, that passed um, legislation that would order the local levy district to pay even closer attention. But keep in mind, the Army Corps is in charge, not the local levy district. Um, I have a hurricane on the way. Uh, fortunately, I got good news this morning. It's not going to reach Cat 5, and it also wobbled a little bit to the west. So New Orleans is, uh, it's not looking as scary as it was last night when I went to bed. But we do have um, Hurricane um, Delta coming. And uh, the encouraging word for the people of New Orleans is we do have the most expensive, most complex, largest hurricane flood protection system in the nation and probably the world. If, if New Orleans, if, if on a scale of one to 10, if New Orleans were a 10, the next closest would be Cape Girardeau, which would be about a three. So we do have a pretty darn good flood protection system. We don't have the right one for a city of our size, population and infrastructure, but we have got a pretty darn good system and a much better system than we did 15 years ago when Hurricanes Katrina's surge arrived. So, um, so the, you know, what are the takeaways? Most of the information I received to do my work came from requests, uh, responses to requests under the Freedom of, of Information Act. You don't have to have an attorney to file a request, but if you do have one, it's great to include his or her cover letter because then your FOIA request goes straight to the offending organization's attorney and they cannot ignore you. And that's what they will try to do. Uh, stalling is the number one uh, instrument or, or tool to evade giving up information that they don't want to give up. Okay, insist on a response in three weeks. Leave a paper trail of questions. If I were to go back 15 years ago, I would have left more paper trails. I would have left more signs that I had been there because later these become important. Never lose your cool, never sound impatient, never sound annoyed. You have to be polite and never defensive and you need to use a neutral speak, which as, as, it, as it suggests, you know, don't take sides, use a neutral tone, and probably most important of all, don't give up. I, I know from the past 15 years, there were many, many times I'd already won and I didn't know it yet, and I would find out later. So don't give up. So um, I, uh, I didn't, I know I don't want to talk too much about my book, but my book was published uh, in August, August 11th. Uh, it is available on Amazon. And the, uh, the, the, I think the best news I can share about it is th three out of five readers, in addition to saying it's a good book and valuable and all that, say once they started it, they couldn't put it down. So it, it, um, it's a page turner. So with that, um, I'm looking forward now to the best part of the presentation, which is the Q&A. Thank you so much. All right.
Thank you so much, Sandy. You're welcome. That was fascinating. And the graphics were great. Thank you. So it looks like everyone's muted. Um, if, let's, let's go ahead and, um, you know, if you have a, a question, go ahead and unmute yourself. Ricky? Yes, I do. Sandy, what distinct part of New Orleans do you live and where the school is and where your husband's office is that didn't get flooded in Katrina? Certainly. Uh, I live distinctly in Uptown. Uh, I live within walking distance of Loyola and Tulane universities. I live on something that's called the Sliver by the River, which is natural, um, natural levees. They're levees, but they're natural. They're not man-made. Uh, that were created after thousands and thousands of years of the Mississippi overflowing its banks. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, since nobody else is jumping in, talk to me a little bit about Amsterdam. It seems to me that I've seen that there are sort of floodgates that hover on top of the water that open and close, That because Amsterdam obviously must be pretty close to New Orleans in terms of jeopardy of flooding. Okay. Uh, I was uh, fortunate to be an invited guest of Senator Mary Landrieu uh, on a uh, congressional delegation visit to Holland in 2009. And I got to see these gates with my own eyes. I got to talk to the people there. The, 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 there are many differences um, between uh, us, the, the New Orleans flood protection and the flood protection in Holland. Notice when I said on a scale of one to 10, I, I, I spoke of locally maintained flood protection. In Holland, they do not have locally maintained flood protection. Everything is federal, uh, not federal. Everything is the, uh, the entire country. The locals aren't told, here, have at it. You, you take care of it yourself. So it, it, it's a, um, the entire country is involved in every person's life there, which is very different. We, here, we, it goes by state. So that's difference number one. Difference number two is if you walk up to anybody in New Orleans and ask them how high uh, above sea level are you or, or at or how far below, everyone here can tell you. If you in, in Holland, if you go up to someone in the Netherlands and say, how, what's your depth of your, of your house, they say, I don't know. They, they, uh, they don't need to know because their government protects them. They don't worry about it. Um, so that's two big differences. And then the third difference is, is, is the Netherlands has something called 10,000 year protection. And what that mean, translates into is protection that in, in any one year, there's a one in 10,000 chance of the flood protection um, not performing. In America, we have, and you're not gonna believe it, 100 year protection. 100 year protection. So, um, which is a, an, a, um, a political decision made by the federal government, that's the best we can get. So you will not find, on just one last thing, you will not find one single expert, including myself, who will agree that the flood protection system that we have for New Orleans is appropriate for a port with the people, property and infrastructure that we have. But it's what we got and it's a lot better, better than what we had 15 years ago. Very interesting, thank you. You're welcome. Patricia, you had a, a question? Jolie's is first. Oh. Ah. Sandy, thank you for that presentation. As somebody who has been voting in the Delta of California for 40 or more, year, 40 or more years, uh, I'm intimately involved and, and uh, concerned about the Delta, Delta levee systems, which most of it, which are just handmade from years and years ago. So have you done any study on the California system? I have looked at the California systems for several reasons. One, my, my um, capacity as leader of levy.org and also out of personal one, my daughter lives in Pacific Heights, uh, San Francisco <laughs> and uh, right by Alto Park. So I see my daughter before COVID. I saw, I saw my granddaughter once a month. So I have a personal reason to be paying attention. The, um, the, the, the good news that I can share with you is that the levy breaches of New Orleans, we, we, we were very much a poster child. And while Governor Schwarzenegger was a governor at the time, he took incredibly um, forward thinking steps and making changes to the uh, local California government or the state government 
uh, about the levy, levy board and their responsibilities. And they required you know, experts on the levy boards. They required um, you know, more, um, more, um, more robust and more frequent levy inspections. And all of these things are good for the people of California because of, the, of these levies are federal. But I, I want to finalize by, by throwing a little caution in there. The Army Corps of Engineers is in charge, not only of building them, but the Army Corps is in charge of the way that levies are maintained. The local levy district has to do what the Corps says. So just keep, in, keep those things in mind. However, um, it, just knowing that is important and it's totally okay as a citizen, citizen to say, wait a minute, what, excuse me? And, and the, I, I, think, I don't think people realize how much power they have uh, as a citizen in this country. Thank you. You're welcome. Trisha? Uh, Sandy, when Hollywood makes your life story or this situation into a movie, and no doubt Julia Roberts will pe play you, <laughs> in the Hollywood plot, there will be death threats against your character. Will that be an exaggeration or were there times that you were concerned? As I detail in my book, uh, there was an event that happened that, that, that did frighten me. Um, I didn't tell my husband about it because I was afraid he would, he would be worried for me and order me to stop my work. And this happened in January of 2006, just as I was preparing to hold a rally at the Army Corps of Engineers building. And uh, on the same day that my car was keyed on both sides, you know, when someone takes a key and keyed every single panel on both sides. So whoever this was really wanted to, to um, do, a, do a job of it. Because my car was filled with yard signs at that moment. But the scary, fr very frightening thing was um, uh, as I should go to step to my back door, right there on the doorstep in my garage was a dead bird with its head chopped off, a pigeon. And this, this wasn't something a cat caught because uh, I've, I, I've been raised with cats in the, in the country and cats like to bring home dead birds. This was not a, a cat's gift. This was a, a threat that was left at my back door. And I picked up the dead bird with a piece of cardboard. I put it in the trash bin and I shut the lid and I shut a lid in my brain. I said, I'm not gonna think about that. It's just the dead bird. <laughs> Um, they're not going to threaten me with a dead bird. And I didn't mention it to my husband. I, again, I told you why, because I was, af I was afraid he would, he, he would be worried for, for me. So, um, but I do document that in my book. Even my son uh, didn't know about it. I didn't tell anyone because uh, I didn't want to let it stop me. And it didn't, obviously. Tricia, you asked the question that I had in my mind, being the only Texan in the call. My first thought was, I sure hope she has a concealed carry license. <laughs> it's uh, you are very, you're very much a hero. We throw that term around too much, but you're very much a hero. Did the Army Corps of Engineers ever have to pay up? No, the Army Corps of Engineers was found responsible, but not financially liable due to the Flood Control Act of 1928, which um, states that the, um, if the Army Corps of Engineers flood protection doesn't perform properly, they're immune from lawsuit. So my, I did, uh, my writing my book, uh, was, I was not successful in, in getting financial um, um, awards for the people of New Orleans, but that's not why I wrote it. I wrote it because the rest of the nation needs to know what happened. And I also wrote it because I thought it would might help uh, for these lo locals who were blamed for the flooding for so long to help them throw off that cloak of shame that they were forced to wear. And I hope to inspire. Sandy, I, I have a question for you. Can you, um, I, I was happy to hear that you mentioned the saltwater intrusion in our bay waters. And I mean, that's huge. Uh, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago and um, Joel's a big advocate for the Delta, but can you just elaborate a little bit on that? The, the uh, information that I spoke about, I, I'm, I'm going to be very um, straight and say, that was my understanding five or six years ago. I have not studied it recently. So, um, but now I will, now, now I will. I mean, my, my family lives in California and I'm going to study it in more detail now. Maybe that could be your, your words whispered in water 
part two. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm writing it down. <laughs> San Francisco version. Pete? You can listen to the presentation that was done a couple of weeks ago on our uh, website. I'll send you the link to it so that you can watch the presentation. All right. uh, uh, Pete, Pete, go ahead. Uh, thank, thanks, Craig. You know, uh, we're, we're all here watching and listening with rapt attention, but the thing that we may think is that, well, you know, we live here in San Francisco, we're not going to get flooded out, never got flooded out before, why should we worry? Well, with uh, sea level rise coming, uh, a lot of us are, are learning a lot about levees. Um, as I mentioned, I, I, I'm a director of San Mateo County Transit District. Well, San Mateo County Transit District, 80% of our buses are parked um, in yards that are subject to sea level rise. And we did find out from our friends at New Jersey Transit, when buses and trains are submerged in salt water, they do not do very well. <laughs> so um, we are now in a, a position where we are learning a lot about levees. Uh, we're fortunate in one case, one yard is right next to SFO, so we can partner with SFO to get some levees up. The other one is not, it's kind of, we're kind of on our own. But uh, anyway, the cities uh, in, in San Mateo County realize that with sea level rise, they are all subject to this. And you are going to see uh, a lot more levees coming up uh, because you can't pick everything up and relocate it. There's no place to bring it. So um, unless we all want to relocate to uh, somewhere where there uh, are no rivers and no potential for sea level rise, we, we've got to get on this. So you're going to see a lot more levees. It's pretty critical, actually. Yeah, good question. That was a very good point. Um, people live near water uh, for irrigation, for navigation, and aesthetics. Uh, so it is, is not reasonable to, to say to everyone, oh, just why don't you move where there's no water? Yeah. That was a very good point. Susan, you had a question? Well, first of all, Patricia, you know my Chicago upbringing. I right away said, I thought to myself, oh my God, someone must have threatened her life. Um, but you mentioned that the reason that there was no compensation was the Flood Control Act of 1926. Eight, I think that eight. was a really long time ago. Is there any movement or concern of, let's see if we can get a review and revision of that Flood Act that would be more appropriate in this era of climate change and disaster? My understanding is no. No, no Congress member has spoken of such a thing. I'm not aware of any organization that has suggested such a thing. Uh, I can tell you right now, if someone were to suggest it, I, I would in two seconds, uh, one second, s s s join that person and say, yes, that law needs to be changed. But my understanding is no. Any other questions? Uh, Bill? Okay. Uh, good morning, Sandy. Thank you very much for the presentation, and thanks for the tips on PowerPoint. <laughs> um, yep. Very interested in this topic because, as a bird hunter, uh, we lost a uh, 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 a hunt club uh, nearby. It's called Sassoon Marsh. This was probably five or six years ago. <clears throat> the levee just you know broke. It's gone. <clears throat> so we had to go elsewhere anyway. So I picked up on that, but. Um, the other reason your topic, um, by the way, uh, <clears throat> I really admire successful authors, and I wish you the greatest success on this book. Appreciate it. Uh, this is a kind of inside joke, but never mind. <laughs> um, oh, what what, <laughs> what, <appreciate> what, <laughs> what struck me was that uh, several years ago, <clears throat> I read a book called The Great Deluge by Douglas Brinkley, mm -hmm. and I just mm -hmm. wondered if you're uh, familiar with, with uh, with this bunch on it. Very much. Uh, I adore um, Mr. Brinkley. Um, yeah. he, he, he's a wonderful historian. He's a good man. He's a good person. Yeah. Uh, I, I will say, and you can quote me, that there are mistakes in his book with regard to the levee breaches. His okay. book was written, I believe, in 2006. Yes, 2006. As, I, as I pointed out, it's impossible. <laughs> it, it took, you know, the, the Columbia Challenger it took 18 months to figure out, I mean, I mean um, 18 months to do that investigation. Right. Uh, I'm sure you all remember the, um, the I-65 uh, I um, a bridge collapse in Minneapolis with, with cars on it, mm -hmm. remember that? That investigation took two years. 
And they were able to close the bridge and not let anyone on it. And still the investigation took that long. So in New Orleans, we had 350 square miles of flooding, 50 breaches, but everyone wanted to know what went wrong now. It, it's ridiculous. It takes many years. The, those, the, the best studies didn't come out in 2008 and two, until 2008 and 2009. So no offense to Mr. Brinkley, 2006 was just too soon. Yeah. Uh, well, that, was, that, was my, that was my main question for you. I looked at the, co yeah. uh, the copyright. It is 20, 2006, and I thought to myself, gee, maybe no, all the information wasn't in. But one, uh, one quick point is that uh, one of the major, this, guy, this Brinkley goes down, as you know, through many, many layers of failure, not just the you know, Army Corps of Engineers, which you didn't have recent information on. Uh, but anyway, a um, lot of failures uh, on a government level and that sort of thing. But I was interested to note that one of the Marines in my battalion in Vietnam, Terry Eber, was the Homeland Security official in New Orleans when Katrina hit. And apparently there was some uh, uh, hesitation, I guess is the way to put it, on parts of the uh, city infrastructure, and he stood up and took charge, apparently, and um, was able to, Terry Ebert, E-B-B-E-R-T, he was a first lieutenant in-, in Terry uh, Ebert. Yeah. yeah. He, I, if I remember correctly, he was mentioned by Brinkley as one of those people who said, hey, this is not working, I'm going to stand up and do some, something about it. The other book that comes to mind, uh, you really got my wheels turning this morning, Sandy, um, is- um, Cadillac Desert, and I forget the name of uh, the name of the author. He's a Mill Valley author. I can't even remember his name, but he's talking about the water system in California. Phil Reeser. Huh? Phil yeah. Reeser. That's it. And uh, he's talking about the whole uh, water infrastructure in California. And this is many, many, you know, like 20 years ago. So anyway, uh, congratulations. I hope you do well in the book. Thank you. Uh, my comment is, um, my book was out to uh, to set the record straight about why New Orleans flooded. I did not need to set the record straight on the failed response. And I, I didn't discuss that, that in the presentation, but uh, in a bipartisan congressional um, opinion, the response was deemed an abject failure yeah. and probably the biggest failure of, was FEMA. But, mm -hmm. th but that's not contested. And I, I, I only touch up on that a little bit in my book. Yeah. What other questions do we have? Hi, Sandy. Hi. Uh, hi, I'm originally from Houston. So I spend a lot of time and energy focused on Houston during uh, hurricane season, which as you know, is in the summer. I lived through Hurricane Carla, no big deal for the Houston Galveston area. You, Some of you may know that Galveston flooded in 1902, I believe. And so they built a seawall, a higher seawall, and that's protected Galveston. But in Houston, my brother and many, many, many of his neighbors came home to two feet of water. And there was some issue with the levee. I never understood the levee part of it. Growing up, we didn't hear about a levee. But um, as everybody knows, floods are more enhanced in the last several years. And I'm just wondering if you're familiar with the Hurricane Harvey situation. And uh, I agree, FEMA didn't do a good job, and the levy, the Army Corps of Engineer didn't do a good job. But I'm just wondering what information you had about that one. Certainly, um, Hurricane Harvey um, was uh, because the storm just stayed and stayed and rained and rained. Uh, we we were affected in New Orleans as well. Uh, what happened is. Houston, just by the way it is, the Houston region, just by, by um, just the way the land is, is, is there, it all drains to one lake. This huge, huge area all drains to one place. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers did not appropriately plan ahead for that. Way too many permits were given to build in areas that were prone to this drainage flooding. Um, water will find its lowest point. Uh, I, will, I, I can close, I'm, I am familiar with it, and I can close by pointing out that uh, uh, a North Bend County uh, commissioner uh, flood, Authority, flood Protection District Commissioner asked levies.org, my little little grassroots group, uh, for our levy county map, the one that you saw I put up on, on this PowerPoint, asked us for that because he, he thought that was very useful. I, I think you should find it interesting that a little grassroots group is getting asked for its, its maps when, well, why aren't these maps, you know, federally produced? Why is there not a, 
a federal organization that's paying more attention to this sort of flooding. Um, I, I, and I will compare that to uh, uh, the Netherlands that does have a federal countrywide program to protect its people from flooding, whereas uh, the United States sort of leaves it up to the states. Um, it shouldn't be that way, but that's, that's the way it is now. And the important thing is to at least recognize that. Uh, Hugh Tuck, you had a question, followed by Anastasia. I saw on the show engineering disasters, there was some country that built some huge floodgates and the floodgates are failing because they didn't account for, uh, I think, silt building up in the, the pits. Do you know, any, hmm. know anything about that? That could well be the Netherlands, um, but it might also be um, the, the Bengali um, Delta, uh, I'm not exactly sure, but when was this? When did you hear about this? Uh, I was on Engineering Marvels about six months ago. I'm not sure when it occurred, uh, but the floodgates evidently won't close when they need to because of built up of silt. I'm not a gambler, but I would bet that's the Netherlands. And I don't gamble. <laughs> All right. Anastasia? Thank you. So I just want to make, make a comment about her book because I, my eyes have been opened. I, and I, I mean, I'm going to say this, Sandy, you haven't heard this from me yet, but I am one of those people that, that just kind of believed what was being put out. And I, in my mind, when it happened, I remember thinking this was the worst hurricane ever. You know, it was just the worst. It was just so horrible. Of course, the levees, you know, failed because it was just so bad. I remember thinking, oh my gosh, why would they rebuild? Why rebuild after all this? Didn't they get their lesson from the first time? And I want to say I'm sorry for thinking that because now that you've opened my eyes and I've read this book, I, I understand I understand very differently than what I thought before. Well, and I know I, now where it came from. I know where it came true. from. You know, yeah. so thank you for opening our eyes. Thank you for, for sharing so much, for your tenacity. Um, Y'all, if you read this book, you're going to be blown away with like officials sending her private emails from their private email address, pretending to be a, a, a citizen and yet they are working for these huge organizations. I mean, the, the harassment, the, 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 oh gosh, it was just awful. It was awful to read this stuff and it kind of made me feel really bad about humanity. And yet you change things because of all the people that are not like that. And it's, it did show that you were on the right path, that you were doing something right to draw that kind of attention. So thank you. Thank you, Sandy, for opening my eyes. Um, I do highly recommend the book. And by the way, if any of you are audio listeners, there is an audible version. So I'm listening to an audible version done by um, a narrator and it's available on audible.com. So you can check that out. Uh, and if any of you know of any groups or organizations that you feel could benefit from hearing from her, will you please let me know because I'm impassioned to get this message out there. Uh, I only represent speakers that I believe in their message, and I am so, so uh, passionate about what she's doing that I want to get as many people out there hearing what she's got to share. So please do let me know about that. And thank you again, Sandy. And thank you to all of you for hosting her. I so appreciate it. With that, I'm complete. Thank you, Anastasia. I think with that, I think that's a great place for us to end the, the formal presentation today. Sandy, would you mind sticking around for a few minutes if we have any further questions? I do not mind. Thank you. And, and uh, everyone, let's just give Sandy a, a great applause and thank you again for joining us today. Really appreciate it. I, we're going to be talking about this for some time and I'm going to, I'm going to get a copy of your book too, because I think that, you know, there's so there's, there's something in there for everybody. And here we're, we're on the coast, you know, we can, we can, I'm still, I think California should be part two. That should be the next chapter. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, guys. Uh, hey, thanks again for, oh, yes. I thought you were done. Go ahead. Oh, no, I just want, before we move on to further questions, I just want to make a, a go over our upcoming events. We have October 14th, Debbie Hoffman's going to be talking Power Up Your Follow-Up. That's next week. 
And then uh, Randall Reader is going to be Will Rogers the following week on the 21st. So uh, we're looking forward to that. And then Michael Haug is going to be um, talking about story mastery um, the following week. So great stuff coming up. So you guys, you know, make sure you put it on your calendar and look for the, uh, the invitations and the information coming out. And we will have a recorded version of Sandy's presentation today available in a couple.